joining your practice live. All right, um, feel free to turn your webcam on if you're feeling brave um, or unmute yourself. And this is really uh, something that we do in coordination with the Grow Your Practice podcast, you know, where we share marketing and really business growth strategies that ultimately help you help more people and uh, grow your practice. So um, at any point, if you have a question, just you can raise your hand virtually. It should be in your Zoom control panel. Or again, just unmute yourself or type it in the chat or the Q&A. Andrew will help moderate here. Uh, for the first 10 or 15 minutes here, I'm going to talk about how we're thinking through um, making up lost revenue in our practice, I'll give you some uh, actual numbers here, and what we've learned in talking with dozens of owners. We've hosted a couple of webinars now and some internal trainings. We just had a live event in Orlando. Um, and I'll share some details at the end on the next live event. But um, yeah, so this is something that we're all facing. So whether it is, um, you know, whether we're insurance based or cash pay based, most of us over the last 12 months have experienced downward pressure on our revenue. For us, um, I can tell you, we had from uh, 2021 collectively to 2022. Um, within my own private practice, we experienced about a $4.50 decrease um, per visit, and that's in revenue coming through. And uh, so literally, I'm solving this, I'm talking with other owners that are solving this, and I'm, I'm sure many of you are uh, doing this as well. So how does that impact our bottom line? Well, if we have downward pressure on revenue per visit, and we have upward pressure on cost per visit, that creates a, a little bit of a problem. We end up between a rock and a hard place. And, uh, you know, essentially what that means is declining margins. And why is that a big deal? Well, most of our team members, staff, employees, they want to work in a stable workplace environment. Many of us have aspirations of leaving a big, bigger impact in our area, maybe leaving a legacy, um, helping more people avoid unnecessary medications, injections, surgery, because we we can help them with our conservative care. So we have these aspirations, but that's really difficult to do if our margins, uh, let, let's say less than 10%. And that is a real benchmark from uh, Greg Crabtree. Uh, you probably have, if you've listened to the podcast, if you've been on our webinars, you may have heard me talk about him. He's a CPA, I believe from Alabama. Um, but uh, yeah, Greg Crabtree has written a lot on this and especially in a service-based businesses, anytime we go less than 10% margin, we're, we're kind of skating on thin ice. Many of us discovered that again three years ago in the beginning of the pandemic, saw a lot of panic, a lot of dramatic uh, business action. So increasing per patient revenue is significant for us um, if we want to provide a stable workplace environment and help more people. So some options of what we've seen uh, owners look at doing. Uh, the, the first one is RTM. This is uh, remote therapeutic monitoring. I'll share my viewpoint on it here in a second. Um, but it, it's essentially um, the ability to bill the insurance company for um, monitoring people doing their home exercises. Primarily, um, and I, I had uh, Brad Saunders, who's a private practice director, manager um, from the Carolinas. He was on, did an amazing job. I believe they have 10 clinics. They rolled this out in their 10 clinics and it provided a boost um, to their revenue. So it's a real option right now. And what we talked about there and my long-term concern is that again, we're relying on insurance company reimbursement and their rules to dictate what our what our revenues are rather than increasing demand for our services within the community and ultimately leaving it up to uh, people to decide whether they want to pay for our services or not. Very much the same way that, you know, personal trainers and massage therapists have been forced to do. So the other thing that we see happening, um, so there's the insurance route and thinking about how we can expand the insurance offerings that we're, we have available or, and that includes, you know, influencing payer mix, um, and, and going down that path. The other one is adding cash pay services. So, uh, you know, there are some examples, for example, you know, for us, we use, we have Lifeforce 
um, lasers, 40 watt laser um, as a modality available in three of our clinics. And that is a cash pay rate. When we look at not only the impact that it has for our patients and the speeding up healing, reducing inflammation, reducing pain effects that that has in the, the plan of care, but there's also a significant bump in our, our hourly treatment rate when we provide that service. Um, that's a win-win for us. Uh, other owners, we can't do this in Pennsylvania, but I have explored dry needling, um, massage therapy, which I've now mentioned twice. I know owners that are uh, exploring that route, fitness classes, or especially small gym uh, private sessions or some sort of uh, gym facility wellness center, you know, selling a membership, <clears throat> online coaching um, is very popular. I have, have a, a former student, former DPT who worked with us, who has a, a huge online uh, coaching business doing really well with it or offering, you know, other digital courses. So I've seen the one-on-one -on -one coaching, small business coaching, one-to-many coaching, and then the other method is just to have, you know, an evergreen course where people can come through and, you know, figure out how to treat their own back or their own neck or whatever the, the uh, diagnosis is. Um, and then the other one is uh, e-commerce, which Jeff Lang made um, in his group, the smart chiropractor, they did a really nice job uh, covering on the podcast as well. And that is, you know, essentially you can get into selling supplements or exercise equipment, um, some sort of renewable subscription type uh, e-commerce, uh, but they're all options to increase revenue. And really what most businesses outside of healthcare will think is that once somebody comes through and um, and we have that customer list, that list is significantly valuable because we know who the buyers are. Large corporations, Target, Kohl's, Hobby Lobby, uh, Starbucks, et cetera, they invest literally millions of dollars if not hundreds of millions of dollars every year, and they, they want this research. Two quick stories on that. Target, um, so I've told this story a few times, but uh, in Charles Duhigg, uh, his book, uh, it's Habit or the Power of Habit, he talks about in the early 2000s, the amount that Target invested to discover um, the golden goose of retail, which is a, a mother, expecting mother in her first trimester. So at this point, she knows that she's expecting. Sometimes she hasn't told other people yet, maybe not has not even had her um, first doctor appointment, but they know, Target knows as a retailer, if they can get her to switch her shopping habits to Target, they likely have her as a lifelong customer. So it's extremely valuable to their model. And Target 20 years ago was not what it is today. Anyhow, they invested a lot here within the data science. Think about, you know, Moneyball and what, uh, you know, Billy Bean did with the Oakland Athletics and apply that to, to retail. That's kind of what this is. And they discovered that um, a mother, an expecting mother, newly expecting mother, is uh, she buys four things. And off the top of my head, they're uh, unscented lotion, cotton swabs, uh, washcloths, and I forget the fourth. But you get the idea. She had she changes her buying pattern, and what Target did is the second that um, somebody would come through and they would buy those things that were new, right, for their their purchasing habits, the, the system flagged that she was likely expecting, and then they would tar they would target. Sorry for the pun and dad joke, but they would um, send her mailings and advertisements, promotions specific to. Uh, newborn clothing and, you know, diapers and everything else, because they knew if she would switch over her buying habits to target again, that, that she would buy, you know, thousands of dollars in formula and diapers and essentially clothing, you know, for the kid and uh, cookware, everything else, her, her groceries, everything else, the whole way through. Um, and it worked extremely well. And, and then there's a, a follow-up story where there was a, a 17 or 18 year old uh, daughter of a superintendent, I think it was in Minnesota, and they flagged her, they sent her, you know, this flyer full of all these pregnancy items, the superintendent, it's mailed to his house, 
he flags it. He wants to know why Target is, and he, he's irate. He's extremely upset. Goes into the local Target and says, why are you sending my daughter this? Well, the local Target has no idea what corporate marketing is doing. And eventually it turns out that the daughter is in fact pregnant and hadn't told anybody yet. So um, yeah, they and Target had to figure out how to dampen that down a little bit. So what does that have to do with us? Well, we have a Target customer. Right. And the fact that they have bought from us in the past, they have invested money for their own health betterment, um, for their improved, you know, longevity or function or whatever it might be. They're likely, they're more likely to consume from us if we have an additional offering. So it would be smart for us to think and value the list of people who we already invested in to buy a service from us and figure out what else that they would potentially buy from us and then offer that to them. So, you know, rather than a $400 plan of care or a thousand dollar plan of care, if we can figure out, you know, what else they're buying, um, then, then that's significant and can add to our top line revenue. The other thing here is that ultimately, you know, we want to, um, there's a couple of ways that we can grow revenue, make up for lost revenue. Number one is we can have, you know, we can add additional services to our existing clients, right? Or, uh, and we can offer them. Not everybody's going to buy laser. Not everybody's going to buy acupuncture or dry needling or uh, hyperbaric chamber or nutritional counseling or whatever, but some a percentage of our clients will when we have that offering, when we roll it out the right way. The other thing that you know is at the base of everything is increasing demand for our services across the board. So the way that I think about it is, one, we have the motion of going out into the community and having people come in and buy our physical therapy services via, you know, uh, rotator cuff or back pain or whatever it is that we're advertising out in the community, right? And then once they're on the list, then we can um, we can step up and offer them, uh, provide them with our other offerings. So building patient demand, demand for our services is key long term, and we always want to remember, you know, how we're doing that. Uh, yeah, and the second component of that again, is reactivations, which we were talking with Dr. Robert here in the beginning, um, and also positioning via email, text, uh, direct mail, et cetera, to our patient list, to our previous client list, the additional services that we're offering. And um, yeah, the I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I could get into talking about lifetime customer value and ROI, but we're going to hold it right there. Um, the other thing that's really important is many of us, uh, so for the four owners on here, just in the chat, um, do you have a low payer? Do you have a payer that you would want to drop, right? So, I mean, in our area, I remember for the first at least 10 years in private practice, we had a payer who was, was $44.88 a visit. And that is brutal, right? So we're losing, literally, it cost us more money to provide the service than it did um, than the reimbursement. So it, we no longer participate with that company, but it was horrible. Um, so do you have a low payer? The other thing to think about is if you can incre increase enough demand for your services and still fill your space and your schedule, is there a way to drop that low payer? And it's impossible to do that. And you, you might feel desperate if you don't have enough, you haven't created enough demand for your services. Um, but it, it's very possible. And again, Ben Wapker's uh, been on here. We just had uh, Sean Weatherstand at our last live event share how he went out of network with, uh, I believe, UHC. And that, it, that was in Idaho. Ben is in uh, the Seattle area. Uh, but they talked about how they systematically looked at their revenue per payer and also ultimately went out of that that network um all right so i have a couple other questions here andrew feel free to ask these um or i can read them as well yeah um i thought i'd share one more thing on um on the payers i actually just talked to an owner yesterday um tony over at kinetics pt and he is the first owner I've heard from who's actually had success um, negotiating with payers and getting getting a higher rate from them. 
Um, so that was really interesting to hear. And like I was asking him what, how was he able to do that? And basically he just said, you know, by staying on them, he heard a lot of like no's at first, but now he has contacts there. They know who he is. Um, and he just stayed on them and like, wouldn't take no for an answer basically. So I don't know if that's the best way to, if, you know, the best way to go about it or not, but it was really interesting for me to hear that he had had, had success with that, with some payers, not all. Yeah, Tony, uh, Tony Sear and his wife, Melissa, they're amazing owners. They were at our last uh, Breakthrough Live event. They were on stage. Uh, Tony specifically was, I think he had 10 team members there as well, brought his in, uh, a lot of his management team and marketing team. And yeah, exactly like you said, Andrea, very gritty, uh, he spent, you know, six months to a year negotiating with every payer and basically nicely said, essentially, if you can't do this, here's my expenses. This is what you're providing me. If you can't meet this, I'm going to leave your network. And he was able to um, negotiate significantly better rates than what I expected. Um, it was surprising. And I know a lot of owners reached out to him. Um, I think he's registered for our next event already, um, if I remember correctly. By the way, um, yeah, we we do have another event here. I'm sure there's a link that we can share, but uh, May 5th through 7th, we'll be here at my office in uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania for a two or three day event. And uh, our focus here is building patient demand. So sharing marketing um, insights with experts, with other owners, just like Tony, about how they're creating demand for their services, and then uh, essentially growing their practices as well. So we'll have a link up for you. Um, you can learn more there. And I believe right now there is a deadline coming up here in a few weeks for a 50% uh, discount, but you can click on that and you'll save $250 on the, the registration. All right, first one is from uh, Tom Williman. Tom asks, any ideas on starting and structure of an online coaching program? Sure. Um, where to start with this? So I did this uh, back in, I think 2011 is, is <laughs> when we started doing this. Um, I did it off of a YouTube video. Um, so at one point I had a, a YouTube video, top three exercises for, I think it was back pain and sciatica, something like that. Uh, it's approaching 5 million views now. I haven't touched it in years. Um, but if at one point, like 2012 to 2014, if you would have Googled sciatica, it was the first video that came up on Google and it came up in the first fold. So we got a lot of traction there. What we did off of that is we surveyed uh, 3,100 back pain and sciatica sufferers from all over the world. And we ended up creating a, a treat your, treat your own back pain course. Uh, it was called Three Minute Relief. No longer is it in existence. Um, there's some gray area around, you know, if I'm a Pennsylvania licensed physical therapist, can I treat somebody who's in California? The answer is yes and no. Um, I can't provide, or Andrea's in uh, Texas, so I can't provide Andrea individual custom, but uh, advice, but she can certainly buy uh, treat yourself at home type information from me. So of course, uh, yeah, the, start there. Um, the first thing that you need to do is not worry about what is in the, the course. That's where most people start is they try to nail and be perfect about, I have this unique way of treating back pain or neck pain or shoulder problems or diabetes, whatever it is. And I'm going to nail this system and then take it to the marketplace. That's the wrong way to do it. You actually want to think about it the other way. So number one, can I build a list around it? Can I deliver value to the marketplace where I have a huge list of people that suffer from whatever the diagnosis is? Start there. You need that list first. If you don't have that, you can't, it, it's counterintuitive, but you can't create the course and then go out into um, the community. That's just not how it works. You'll you'll miss too many things. Um, and I'll give an example. In the early days of breakthrough, this might even been before there was breakthrough. Um, I had done uh, eight hours 
of recording in my office on a Sony Handycam. That's how long ago this was. <laughs> and uh, I had this entire marketing course laid out for uh, private practice owners. And I got to the end of the day and I went to edit it and I noticed um, I hadn't hit, I hadn't checked the volume. So I had no audio. Um, absolutely devastating. It was a blessing in disguise because if I would look at the content that I had put in there, what I thought was important to other practice owners, I completely missed the mark. And likely as a clinician, you're going to do the same thing. So, you know, if I had to guess what, you know, Andrea, what's the, what's your latest, uh, what was your malady, back pain, your injury? Yes. Yep. So if I had to guess as a clinician, having no experience in online coaching before or information, I'm likely going to be pretty far off from exactly what Andrea is looking for. But if I learn her story a little bit better, so if I download, you know, uh, my favorite exercise to help people return to what was your activity? Paddleboarding. Paddleboard, right? Like, so Andrea loves to paddleboard loves to be uh, in the ocean. And that is something where, you know, maybe she downloads a checklist or something that's a video that's very easy for her to consume. And now she's on my list. And ultimately, I can learn more about her exactly what she's trying to do. And I can deliver it in a better way um, for her that she's going to be able to consume and ultimately um, consider more valuable. So start the other way. Think about building the list first. If you're developing a coaching program, Tom, and then, um, yeah, build that list first and then develop the program by closely working with that list of people that are ultimately going to buy your product or your coaching program. Um, there's a lot of people in this space too. Uh, there, live question. Any ideas on how to add more cash programs for a pediatric practice whose patients are mostly Medicaid only? Sure. Um, so you, there's an assumption here that I could be way off on, but I'm assuming it, the, the reason that you wrote in Medicaid only is that you're concerned about the willingness to pay, right? So if you, you know, you, you, you can't sell um you can't sell space travel right to certain demographics of people you can sell it well to billionaires and basically none of us other mere mortals are going to be able to afford space travel anytime soon right so it's the same thing you know um if there's not a willingness to pay there and there's not some form of expendable income or affluence that there's not much to be said i mean you can't um, you know, you can't go to in, an impoverished or struggling area anywhere in the world and hope to sell, you know, luxury items, for example. So you want to make sure that there's a market message um, or a, a market match for whatever it is that you're trying to sell. We see lots of mistakes here, right? Of just uh, small business, beginning businesses, just they launch a product that they think is a fit and it's just way, way off. And it's not, it, that's not real at all. So I would talk to them, you know, I would talk with the families of the patients and what are they buying? You know, are they looking to buy an inexpensive uh, multivitamin or are they looking to, you know, how do they think about nutrition? And I, I would get your ideas there and see, I would look for places they are already spending money. And is there a way that I can provide that with some low margin um, that, that is going to be affordable for them? I would look at that first. Right. So start there, have conversations. There's a process called um, that we use all the time called idea extraction, but it's a way of asking questions to uh, people who could potentially buy your product um, or buy your service and to get ideas. Like rather than inventing idea, like I'm going to think about this perfect idea as a hermit over underneath this mango tree and then go to the marketplace. You don't want to do that. You want to do the opposite, right? Andrew, uh, is there potential to build demand for those services outside of the existing Medicaid patients? Great question. Um, so Peg Gray submitted, uh, what is the ROV? I don't know what that means either. Um, I was thinking she might've meant ROI. 
Um, Could be. Is I near V? Nope. Um, I just wanted to see if it was close on the keyboard. Um, yeah. So, I mean, ROI depends on a lot if that is what, what you're considering. I tend to look at, so let, I mean, this is super strict business thought, not warm and fuzziness. Um, but, you know, as an owner, when we look at our 45 clinicians or so, there there is basically an hourly rate that we're getting some combination of insurance reimbursement and cash pay. And let's say off the top of my, my head, I'm going to say that's $125 an hour, right? So $125 an hour. What I'm looking for is anytime that we're adding a, a cash pay um, service or additional service, I want to be higher than that rate, right? So I know what it costs to provide a visit, what it costs to provide service per hour. I want to be looking for things that I can add more. So for example, you know, 40 watt laser treatment, um, that rate is roughly $240 an hour, right? So that's something that we can provide at a significantly higher margin uh, padding cushion than our typical physical therapy service that we're providing. How are people managing high demands for salaries without reimbursements changing? Uh, tough question. So again, it, it, it's exactly what we're talking about here. The So last Friday, we had 12 graduating DPT students literally in my office here. Right here, I have a whiteboard that we were uh, talking about. We, we covered three areas. One was, here's the current state of healthcare. This is what's going on. They had no idea, 0 for 12, that, you know, there were Medicare cuts, you know, significant 10% Medicare cuts plus um, over the last five years. So no idea about that. No idea that there's another one slated for an additional 4% here in 2024. Um, then we talked about, uh, we have a report, 17 questions that you should be asking in an interview. So really we're delivering value to them, helping them find a better first job. Like, and here's why it's important to be asking these questions, because you might take, you know, the first job that comes along that is, you know, two to $5,000 more than where you're at today. Here's how to evaluate whether, you know, student loan repayment is worth your while and all these other um, things. So we then we deliver that. And the final thing we talked about is having some sort of career path. So here's where you're going to start when you're out of school. And then ultimately, here's how to build value uh, in your career over time. So that is, that's how we're navigating right now. Yes, you know, they could go to the hospital and earn $10,000 to $20,000 a year more right off the bat, but we're showing them a way that they can career path, have more responsibility, work in the setting that's outpatient PT that they want to work in. Um, and, you know, ultimately, we're going to support them in that in that career path. Heather, curious about your results. Robert, reactivations. Um, what do you do if you have a slow season and nothing seems nothing is working for you? So, all right, we'll go there. Um, <laughs> The, yeah, so first, let's call it nine years in practice, really the, the fourth quarter of every year, we would lose a significant amount of money. 2007, that number was um, $44,000 we lost in Q4, and that's revenue minus co cost or expenses. So it was negative 44. Two years later in 2009, it was negative 98,000 plus. Um, pretty devastating. And then what, how we problem solved that is we went back and we said, okay, so it's the end of the year, specifically Thanksgiving through the holiday season. And there are three places we can get new patients from. We can go to the physician. Well, they're crowded with um, white powder deliveries, which are white powder is sugar and flour, right? So all the farm pharmaceutical reps are in there. The equipment DME reps are in there and they're bringing stuff with sugar and flour. So, um, you know, chocolate and 
baked goods, things along those lines. Very tough to compete. And it's where, uh, you know, the, it's hard to stand out in that type of environment, especially during the holiday season. Second place we can get new patients from is we could go to cold traffic, right? Always the most expensive, people who don't know, like, and trust us yet. And the other thing that happens is at least where we're at in central Pennsylvania, from Thanksgiving through the end of the year, because of Black Friday and other shopping specials, that area is very crowded as well. So Target, Kohl's, Hobby Lobby, um, TJ Maxx, Ulta, they're just flooding all the media types online and offline in our area with offers um, to encourage holiday spending and buying. So the where we decided to go was to our past patient list. And we did a promotion around reactivations. We call that promotion uh, the greatest promotion ever. I wrote about it in Killer Marketing Secrets. We have multiple trainings on it. We cover it at almost all of our live events. And that is um, go, figuring out how to go to your past patient list is key. One of my favorite stories ever was uh, we were working with an owner, a smaller practice owner, kind of in a desperate situation where they needed to bump up uh, their reactivations. And I think they had a list of uh, roughly 300 past patients. And um, they sent out this promotion. This gentleman hopped on a call. I believe his name was Anthony, if I remember correctly. And Anthony said, hey, I sent out your promotion. Did not work. And I said, when did you send it out? And it was, I think he said last week. And it was a Tuesday, just like today. And I said, okay, so you took it to the post office about a week ago. That should be hitting the mail right now. Hop on next Tuesday and let me know how, if it's still a zero. I was like, wow, like either this guy has a list of people who don't like him or the mail is just slow in his area, which it is for many of us. He ended up waiting an additional week and he said, I've had 31 people call my office. Remember, he only mailed 300. 31 people call my office, schedule an appointment, and he ended up with 31 plans of care out of that. So he capped it at 20. He had a waiting list of 11 people that he had to fit in, and he ended up with 31 plans of care. And it was more than enough for him to fill his schedule and also the schedule of his um, associate at the time as well. So that lots of success stories there. Hundreds of practices have, you know, gone there and um, increased the demand for their services through their patient list. That is the one that we see that works the most often. And specifically, we run it right before our slow season. So if our slow season is Thanksgiving through the end of the year, we usually run it the last week in October or the first week in November. Other areas of the country that have slow seasons, wherever you're at, they're typically doing the same thing with practices we're working with. Last one uh, question I see here, what are some effective and consistent marketing strategies? All right, um, I'm gonna give you one. And th this is, I'm, I'm trying to simplify a, a lot of way too many answers that more than we have time for. Focus on providing value. That's it. it. Just focus on delivering valuable information to whoever you want to attract in the clinic. And and it 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 bears repeating. Um, I was not smart enough. Somebody told me this in the beginning, and I made it harder than what I what I had to make it. But if you really understand who it is that you're trying to serve, so pick a target market. For example, our practice is 45 to 64 year old family oriented females. I talk about this all the time. Many practices have adopted the same model. And the, the beauty in that is we not only are able to attract that target market, who is frequently ignored and overlooked, but she's the number one consumer in the world. And she, she makes 70% of all medical appointments. So for example, my wife fits in this category. She not only, uh, she just reminded me this morning, I have a dentist appointment on Thursday. She was said, here's your reminder, Thursday morning, you have this appointment. Um, she schedules the appointment for our six children. She is a little bit involved or at least in know of where my parents have appointments and also her parents have appointments. And so she's pretty responsible. The other thing is she's social. 
So when she finds a good provider, um, she is sharing that quickly. So for example, we had, uh, so our, our 10 year old son, Grayson, his bedroom had this like hideous yellow wall <laughs> coloring. We very much needed painted. Um, I had a friend who just went out on his own and started his own painting company, Ryan. Ryan came out over the weekend, painted this room. Uh, it was a minimal cost. It was unreal. Um, we, and she actually gave him more money than what he asked for. And then she told, we had a birthday party that night on Sunday night, and she told everybody, hey, if you have a room, call Ryan. So she's social. So that's our target market. And what happens is we don't pay to put a trainer, uh, an ATC in the local high school, but we still get the star quarterback. We still get the um, you know star basketball player or uh, star soccer player, whatever it is. Like she or he will still come through because her mom has been a patient here, right? So we start there. Think about providing her value, right? So how does she think? What is she looking for? Um, she do doesn't want something overly complex. Um, she might not read a book that we write, but she might watch a video, right? On TikTok or on YouTube or in an email. So we think about how to cater to her and we deliver value to her. And then as a result of that, we get everybody else. Focus on delivering value first. Don't think like a clinician. Don't try to give a doctorate to every patient that you're seeing on social media. Don't think like that. Think about what they're looking for in their terms and deliver that. And that should serve you pretty well. Thanks, Chad. Um, there were three other questions that came in um, from the Patient Demand Facebook group. Um, but I also just wanted to give um, everybody who's on the call the opportunity to ask Chad a question. If you have one, um, just a reminder, you're welcome to come off mute, to turn on your camera if you'd like um, and chat with us, ask Chad a question, or you, you can drop a question in the chat as well. Um, but for the questions that came in from Facebook, uh, the first one was from Catherine Lynn. She was interested to know if anyone has had success selling supplements. Uh, so I don't have experience here. I know, again, Jeff Langmaid, I think, is a, an awesome resource where they help. I believe they've helped hundreds of practices roll that out. Um, there are a few others that I know. One, but yeah, um, I haven't personally done that, but I know other people that have. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, this will ultimately get published on the podcast. And when we put it there, I'll, I'll drop uh, Jeff's resource for supplements in the show notes. Awesome. Um, we also had a question from, um, don't know how to pronounce her name, Alka. Um, do you have to use a specific CPT code for cash-based in your EMR for things like cervical rolls, arch supports, et cetera? No idea but I, we have people that will, would know that answer. I have no idea how we, we code for that. I only pay attention to the revenue, but yeah, Tracy Doherty here would know that. Um, Bob Kowalik, I'm, I'm sure there is, there are more than one way to track any cash pay services that you're offering um, based on what EMR you're using. Cool. Thank you. Um, the next question was from uh, Daniel. I'm curious to know if any clinics have their PTs schedule patients out as a requirement during their visit. If so, how is it going? If not, why not? Yeah, so we switched to scheduling out full plan of care probably in uh, 2005. Um, I'll never go back. We were told in some areas where we were opening additional clinics that, hey, people in this area, they only schedule week to week. And we went into those areas and scheduled it out, the entire plan of care. Um, here's one of the main reasons that you want to do that. The organizational stress that it puts on your front desk. To So Andrea comes in today. It's a Tuesday. I schedule two more visits. And then on Friday, I'm going to schedule her again for next week. Now we have to have the conversation all over again, right? So just think about 
that from the receptionist point of view, a lot more work, or from Andrea's point of view as a patient who's now paying us via insurance or copay or high deductible or cash pay, right? So, okay, Andrea, um, we're going to schedule two more visits this week, and then we'll we'll play it by year after that, right? So think about the level of authority that I have versus saying, okay, Andrea, you're going to need 12 visits. We're going to schedule uh, twice a week for the next six weeks. Uh, follow me out up front here, and Deb's going to take care of you and schedule all your visits, right? Now, we, we've just done future pacing, right? So now she is way more bought in to the plan of care, right? We can always remove them. We can always add in the future, but um, she is way more invested in the plan of care. She has a better expectation. She, uh, Miles, uh, well, I'm liking all Miles' last name, Botson, I think was on our podcast recently, and he talked about this as well, about forecasting or foreshadowing what's going to happen. We want to know what's going to happen, right? So in, in that case, it's always, almost always more beneficial to schedule out the full plan of care. Again, you can remove, you can change or whatever, but it, it's much better for from the patient perspective. If you were in their shoes, you would want that to happen. And it's way better for your front desk from an, an organizational stress standpoint. Yeah, I can say as a patient who's um, bought multiple different services from PT to chiropractic to acupuncture, I've experienced both, like those that had a plan of care and scheduled it all out. And in my, it was just like, no question in my mind, like, okay, I'm going to these appoint appointments. And then like the acupuncturist most recently said, you know, I want to see you for two months, once a week, but she didn't, it was on me to schedule every single week and schedule all of my own appointments online. And I, I dropped that like halfway through because I was like, uh, I don't think I'm going to keep paying for this, but yeah, I'm pretty sure if it had all been pre-scheduled, I just would have gone to my appointments as, as they were scheduled. Yeah, that's a great question. And, uh, also a great follow-up case in point. Thanks for sharing that, Andrew. Um, Molly dropped a comment in the chat. Um, I'll read that to everyone. Our brand new outpatient therapy and wellness center is in the process of hiring an SLP, PT, and OT and having difficulty with getting credentialed as in-network with insurance as most networks are closed. We do have med B. Is it okay to get started seeing patients on cash basis or wait until we get more payers? Is it okay to start? Um, that feels like a compliance legal question. So compliance expert for those areas, I mean, I would go to BCMS. They should be able to help you out, um, especially navigating Medicare waters and territory. Uh, but yeah, BCMS um, is uh, Alicia Nevins, Mahoney, Mary DeLong. They're fantastic. Bob Kowalik and uh, Revenue Cycle Solutions would be another one or uh, somebody specific to, you know, an attorney who specializes in that field. We regularly have gone and worked with uh, Paul Welk in the past also. Thanks for your question, Molly. Um, I just dropped a link to BCMS's website in the chat. Okay, cool. Any other questions before we wrap up here? I can do a preview of what we're working on here for uh, the next Breakthrough Live event. Yeah, so we'll be here May 5th through 7th. This is the first time in six or seven years that we're hosting an event here at my clinic. Um, we have people in every area. So I think what, just in the first email, I think we already have 37 people registered for the event. Um, we have to cap it at 100. It's a true cap based on the size of the office. So the treatment area I think is uh, 7830. So a little over 7,800 square feet in our gym area. We're going to be able to um, have about 100 people there, plus the Breakthrough team and maybe um, a few other friends of Breakthrough, we'll call it. <laughs> um, the, you know, and 
guest speakers, et cetera. So a hundred owners and or their teams, um, what they want is planned for is we're talking specifically about marketing. So we're going to have experts in, uh, for example, um, Robert mentioned the single question email. Carl will be here, uh, co-founder here and the CEO at Breakthrough. He'll be here. He'll be teaching marketing uh, with our marketing team as well. So we'll be discussing everything from Facebook, Google, YouTube, meta ads, TikTok ads, uh, offline advertising, email reactivation, all of that essentially on day one. Then on day two, when we're here in the office, we're going to be doing a, a round table with people that are in the trenches doing the various roles. So for example, many of us are as owners are clinicians and maybe we have a receptionist or a marketing person who's handling uh, email and texting and uh, you know, our marketing along those those avenues and answering the phones and ultimately scheduling patients. So for those days, we're going to have a small group roundtable where you can actually go station to station. And those stations will be about 30 minutes long, and you'll be able to pick and choose what you want to learn about. So this is this comes from a lot of owner feedback and a lot of attendee feedback in our previous previous events, but you'll get to be able to go and learn from whatever expert uh, you want to learn based on uh, what it is that you're looking for. So we're going to have a station on, you know, how to um, how to handle we call them confirmation calls, but when somebody responds to an ad and they have the first contact with your your clinic, what does that conversation sound like? And we're going to have people in the room that actually do that. We have um, a few people that have closed over 100% in a workshop presentation or lunch and learn, whatever you want to call it. Um, they are going to be presenting how they think about um, presenting to a group, presenting information on diabetes or shoulder pain or neuropathy or whatever it might be. They're going to be presenting as well. So you're going to get to hear from lots of experts, other successful people, and how they're implementing successful strategies within their private practice. It's going to be a great event. We're going to have some fun wrapped up in there too. Um, but the breakthrough team will be here. Lots of owners will be here. Um, and again, we have to cap that at 100. We do have a special offer. Um, if you're here now or you're listening to this on the Grow Your Practice podcast, you can claim a, a ticket for less than 50%, uh, or I'm sorry, less 50%, uh, 50 discount. Um, we'll, I don't have the exact link, but uh, Andrea will have it right now. Yeah, I dropped the link in the chat as well as the code. So for the 50% discount, you can use the code LIVE2023. Um, and that link is in the chat and will be added to the show notes and the podcast as well. Cool. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And thanks, Chad, for all of the useful information. As always, have a great week, everybody.